Our final reading this evening comes from the first chapter of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Let us pray. God, tonight we celebrate Your Word made flesh. We pray that as we celebrate this story, as we hear this story again, that You would speak to us, that we might see Your light, the light of the world, Your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Shortly after my sixth grade year, my family relocated from Southern California to Western Michigan. And uh, so I was just starting seventh grade when we moved. And at the beginning of my eighth grade year, we went to a choir concert at the high school in town. My older sister was already in high school. She was in the choir, so we were going to see her perform and so many other uh, people performing in that concert. And I, being an eighth grader and especially being uh, new to the, uh, the community, was eager to make a good impression on the high schoolers. Um, and uh, I, wanted, I wanted to, uh, you know, to, to, I was eighth grade, I wanted to be cool and, you know, and all that stuff. And I was so very, very nervous about how that was all going to go. One of my first experiences in a high school setting. So the concert was going on, I needed to leave to use the restroom, and as they often do in a choir concert like this, they, um, you know, the lights are, are very dim in the auditorium, and so they will only open the back doors to let people out between performances, because then the light from the hallway will flood in and it causes a distraction, so I waited till between acts, I got up and, uh, and I left, and as I came back in, I waited outside, like I was supposed to do, until the current act ended. And they opened the door and they let me in and they closed the door behind me and it was dark again. And I looked around and I realized I'd gone through the wrong door. I was in the wrong aisle. Uh, I couldn't get over to, I really needed to be one door over. But by the time I realized this, the, the, the act had already begun. Um, and there were a lot of vocal ensembles that night, but in this case it was a soloist, a, a tenth grade, ninth grade a uh, girl singing a solo, sitting on a stool with a spotlight on her. It was all dark, and, and, and boy, she had a magnificent voice. It was beautiful. But here I was, stuck standing in the aisle, and I thought, I've got to stand here for this entire performance and then wait to leave and then wait again to come back in. That's, that's, that's a little much. I'm just going to try to make my way uh, over to my seat. And so I, I go to the very back of the, of the seats, between the back row and the wall, and I, I sort of just inch my way behind that row of seats to get over to the aisle I needed to be in to get to my seat. As I'm doing that, I'm, I'm inching back behind the soundboard. There it is right there, and a couple of people <laughs> operating it. And it turns out that the entire soundboard, including the lights, is all plugged in one <laughs> plug. <laughs> and that plug was in the wall, uh, right where I was inching my way past. So my leg, my leg bumped something, and the music stopped, and the lights went out, and I knew I had done it. And some helpful person in the back row says to me, you idiot. <laughs> but thankfully, it's dark. Nobody can see. And so I, I am this, this nervous eighth grader wanting to make a good impression at, at what will soon be my high school. And, and I am just, just terrified, and I can't get out of the situation fast enough. But I do bend, I try to do the right thing. I bend down and I try to, try to plug it back in. Maybe it'll pick up where it left off and she can keep singing and no one will have noticed. But I'm, I'm, I'm so nervous, I can't get the plug in. And, and, I, and I stand up when someone reaches back to help me plug it in. And right when I stand up, the lights come on. 
And so there I am, standing there for the whole world to see. Uh, they all know who the culprit was for this uh, horrible mishap. And uh, so I find my way back to my seat, and I, I, I bury my, my face in my hands for the rest of the show. It, was, it will go down in, in my history as one of my most embarrassing moments. When the lights came on, I was exposed. I, I, had, I had the cover of darkness uh, at first, I, I, was, I was safe, I was unafraid, I, I, um, I could have gotten away with it. Until the lights came on, I was, I was exposed. The light exposes us for who we are. The light exposes the world for what it is. Over the weeks of Advent, we have been talking about the dawning of God's light. God's light is dawning on the world and light serving as a metaphor for God's coming kingdom, God's reign, God's rule, the world as God intends it to be. We know that the world now is not the way God intends it to be, but we believe and we trust and we hope that one day it will. And we believe that the light of God, the rule of God, the reign of God, this coming kingdom of God is, is beginning to creep in. It's beginning to dawn on the world. A long time ago, a light shone in the darkness. A long time ago in Bethlehem, in a stable, a light shone in the darkness. God's Light broke into the world, shining against all odds. It was an unlikely young woman. It was an unlikely place. It was an unlikely retinue of visitors. It was an unlikely Messiah. But God's light had broken into the world. Now people expected God's Messiah to come and to do what they felt they needed, what they felt they wanted. They expected God's Messiah to come and to do what was best for the people of Israel. They expected God's Messiah to come and to do what was best naturally for themselves. And don't we have the same expectations of God's work in our lives? Jesus says in John's Gospel, I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. Doesn't that mean, Jesus, that we should be happy? Doesn't that mean, Jesus, that, that your work in the world is about making things better, making things great, making things happy, as if the dawning of God's light is intended to make things merry and bright? A wonderful Christmas phrase, merry and bright. But is that really what God's light is supposed to do? When the lights came on, when the house lights came up in that high school auditorium, it was bright, but it was not merry. I was exposed. It was a terrible experience for me. God's Messiah, the light of the world, has not come to help Israel achieve its goals. Has not come to help us achieve our goals. The light has come to expose the world for what it is. To expose the world for what it is, to shine light in the darkness so that what has been concealed can be seen, can be known and understood. For a brief historical moment, that night, it began that night in a stable, that for a brief historic moment, the house lights came on and people saw the world clearly. People saw the world for what it was. When Jesus ate with sinners, people saw clearly that our efforts to maintain purity and piety and separation from sinners amounts to the uh, hypocrisy of the highest order. When Jesus flipped the tables of the money changers in the temple, the world saw clearly that there are things that matter more to God than our religious observance. When Jesus died on the cross, the world saw clearly that the coming reign of God hinges on the rejection of violence, which is, of course, the foundation of human power. And when Jesus rose from the dead, the world saw clearly that human power can go only so far and no further. When Jesus was born in a stable, in an obscure place to obscure parents. 
the world saw clearly that Emmanuel, God with us, does not mean God with us as a hero coming to conquer, but it means God with us as a companion. God with us as a friend. God with us as one who knows the darkness, as one who has experienced and lived the darkness, and one who walks with us through the darkness. And as quickly as the light came, it was gone. Jesus lived 30 years, 33 years, most of it in obscurity, a few years of notoriety, a few years of teaching ministry, and then as quickly as it came, the light was gone. But we know the light never really left. We know that the light remains with us. Something was set in motion that night in Bethlehem. Something incredible began that has not stopped. God has set something in motion. The, the Gospel writer John says that the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not overcome it. When it seems like the light has gone out, the darkness has not overcome it. World War I broke out in the summer of 1914. And along the western front of that war in western Europe, the, the, the fighting was characterized by trench warfare. The two sides had, had literally dug trenches at some points a mere 50 yards apart from each other. Deep trenches that allowed them to be sheltered from the gunfire of their enemy. And uh, outside of the trenches, uh, barbed wire fences. And much of the work of that war was inching those barbed wire fences just a little bit at a time for the most minuscule gains at, at, the, at, at the most unimaginable cost of life. At the end of the day, at the end of that war, the, the bloodshed was um, 15, 16 million lives lost. It remains one of the most bloody wars in all of history. And so the soldiers fighting in these trenches were stuck in these awful places and they were wet and they couldn't dry out and it was filthy and miserable and their comrades were dying and they were looking out onto this, this no man's land beyond the barbed wire where their, their fellow soldiers were dead or dying because they were wounded. And no one could, could go out to get them. It was, a, uh, it was a war characterized by stalemate as these trenches faced each other and could do so little to make any noticeable progress. And because progress was so hard to come by, because the soldiers felt like they were accomplishing nothing and putting their lives on the line, within a relatively short amount of time, the soldiers began to wonder why they were even fighting. The soldiers began to see in their opponents, in their enemies, themselves. Young men, very young men, equally puzzled by the war that they were fighting, by the, the orders that they were commanded to fulfill. One hundred years ago tonight, Christmas Eve, 1914, there was a strange silence on the Western Front of World War I. Soldiers who wrote home described it as a silent night. And as that night went on, and as the silence continued, there was no gunfire. A few German troops at different points along the line took a small tree and put candles on it to resemble a Christmas tree and they, they hung it, they, they put them up on, on these barbed wire fences. Gradually certain daring soldiers began to emerge from the trenches. The Germans would say, you no shoot, we no shoot. And they got up and on a Christmas morning in the daylight, the German soldiers and the French and Belgian and British soldiers found themselves in this hellish no man's land, strewn with bodies, talking to one another, laughing with one another, exchanging cigarettes and rations with one another. Given enough time, they began to help each other bury their dead. 
and allow time to, to, to clear the, the wounded from no man's land who otherwise would be left there to die. There are even stories in letters home of soccer games being played in no man's land on Christmas Day 100 years ago in the midst of one of the darkest, bloodiest wars that, that human history has ever known. In the midst of that darkness, a little bit of light now that's a dramatic story, and, and the light that breaks into the darkness of this world does not always have to be quite so dramatic. We experience the darkness in, in so many different ways throughout our daily lives, in so many small ways we can feel the darkness, we know it's there. In fact, more often than not, I think we wonder where the light is. The light shines in the darkness. But the darkness did not overcome it. We can see the light dawning. We can see the light breaking through. Frederick Buechner is an author and pastor, and he writes a monologue from the perspective of a shepherd on this night in Bethlehem. And I want to share it with you. This is the voice of the shepherd. Night was coming on, and it was cold, and I was terribly hungry. I had finished all the bread I had in my sack, and my gut still ached for more. Then I noticed my friend, a shepherd like me, about to throw away a crust he didn't want. So I said, throw the crust to me, friend. And he did throw it to me, but it landed between us in the mud where the sheep had mucked it up. But I grabbed it anyway and stuffed it, mud and all, into my mouth. And as I was eating it, I suddenly saw myself. It was as if I was not only a man eating, but a man watching a man eating. And I thought, this is who I am. I'm a man who eats muddy bread. And I thought, the bread is very good. And I thought, ah, oh, and the mud is very good too. So I opened my muddy man's mouth full of bread and I yelled to my friends, by God, it's good, brothers. And they thought I was a terrible fool, but they saw what I meant. We saw everything that night. Everything. Everything. Can I make you understand, I wonder? Have you ever had this happen to you? You've been working hard all day. Your dog tired, bone tired, so you call it quits for a while. You slump down under a tree or against a rock or something and just sit there in a daze for half an hour or a million years, I don't know. And all this time your eyes are wide open, looking straight ahead someplace, but they're so tired and glassy they don't see a thing, nothing. You could be dead for all you notice. Then, little by little, you begin to come to. Then your eyes begin to come to. And all of a sudden, you find out you've been looking at something the whole time, except it's only now you really see it. One of the ewe lambs, maybe, with its foot caught under a rock. Or the moon scorching a hole through the clouds. It was there all the time. And you were looking at it all the time. But you didn't see it until just now. That's how it was this night, anyway. Like finally coming to, not things coming out of nowhere that had never been there before, but things just coming into focus that had always been there, and such things. The air wasn't just emptiness anymore, it was alive, brightness everywhere, dipping and wheeling like a flock of birds, and what you always thought was silence stopped being silent and turned into the beating of wings, thousands and thousands of them, only not just wings. As you came to more, but voices, high, wild, like trumpets. The words I could never remember later, but something like what I'd yelled with my mouth full of bread. By God, it's good, brothers. The crust, the mud, everything, everything. Oh well, if you think we were out of our minds, you're right, of course. And do you know it was just like being out of jail? I can see it still. We tore off across that muddy field like drunks at a fair, and drunk we were, crazy drunk, splashing through a sea of wings and moonlight and the silvery wool of the sheep. Was it night? Was it day? Did our feet touch the ground? Shh, shh, you'll wake up my guests, said the innkeeper we met coming in the other direction with his arms full of wood. And when we got to the shed out back, one of the three foreigners who were there held a finger to his lips. At the eye of the storm, you know, there's no wind, nothing moves, nothing breathes. Even silence keeps silent. So hush now, hush. There he is, 
You see him? You see him? By almighty God, brothers, open your eyes. Listen. Christmas is a good time to realize that the light is dawning all around us. See it. Hear it. Feel it. God's reign is coming. God's good kingdom is on its way. The world as God intends it to be. The light has already begun to shine. And it begins with this child. It begins with this little light shining in the darkness. God has entered into the darkness for our sake. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not overcome it. Let us pray. God, may we see your light this Christmas. May your light break through the darkness in our lives. When all we see around us is darkness in the world, may your light break through. May we be filled with hope and expectation at what you are doing in our lives and in this world so that we might join with you with the work of bringing your light of sharing your good news, of eagerly anticipating your coming kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.